Well, the second talk this day here, uh, the second talk with the topic of of uh, gender and how to feel and how to be and what am I and uh, not male, not female, something in between. Um, I assume you basically all know intersexuality, intersex people and um, that it is even more difficult uh, for intersex to, to fit into something like society than, for example, trans people. Um, so, Maya is, fortunately, I'm so happy, Maya is a member of, uh, of Entropia. She lives in Karlsruhe and um, so I can see her every day and it's great to talk to her and, and we talk a lot of intersex and her, her way of going through her life, uh, managing her life and so and yeah, she, she talks about how the internet um, affected her, her being, her, her search in, in getting help and getting around uh, in, in terms of intersex. So, a warm welcome to Maya. Uh, okay, yeah, I have to stay here because microphone. So I'm bound to this, so I can't walk around, so remember. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so um, enough to go back to how I want to start. Right, well, that the card says basically everything already. Um, the introduction, pretty much everything, like, because, well, okay, I'm intersex. Um, tell more about it later. And um, the internet has been really, really important to me in, well, basically I'm here this location and still alive because of the internet. So that's pretty big, I think. Okay. <laughs> um, so let's get started uh, the beginning, because everything has a sort of beginning. Because uh, before I can tell about how important the internet is, how important, uh, well, how everything has happened, I first must start at the beginning, like, well, um, I was born and raised in the 80s, so my parents were, well, those were my parents. <laughs> of course, we, we didn't have the, uh, the floppy drive, that's too expensive, but of the really official monitor, we just had a, well, TV works. The winter games, everything, I've played it so much. And of course, the little tape drive, seeing those, those numbers spinning and having to stop at the right location. And ah, yes. That's my childhood. So that's, that's how I started. Then, of course, a bit later, well, you get older, you get a better system, a little bit faster. So I actually had an PS2, IBM PS2, with a Model M keyboard. It was great. So, yes. Not that monitor, I think. No, we had a uh, cheaper one, of course, always. School. Well, that was my teacher. I really liked the teacher. Could play King's Valley on there. So, that's great. Of course, friends. Of course, they have friends. Yes. It was actually my, uh, my younger brothers. He bought that one used, so and he mostly played on it. But I played sometimes on it as well, and it was really fun. And then I bought that one. So yeah, wasted childhood. Not sure. <laughs> Other friends, of course. That's my current uh, small part of my current library. So what else it detailed? I would read lots and lots and lots, and in the um, at school, I remember sitting there in classroom, and we were someone talking about how many books have you read, 
and then someone said, well, Maya has read like more than 300 books. I still remember everybody looking at me, so and it was like, uh, yeah, okay, I've read a lot of books, is that okay? So um, my childhood and youth was basically like um, being raised by computers, video games, of course having fun with lots of people and playing a bit of soccer as well, and reading more books. And then the internet happened. It's quite amazing when suddenly all the computer systems you had, well, they can do internet. So you must have something, of course, Windows 95 with 65K modem. Of course, really fancy. Remember, I could be on the internet for like one hour a day. Because you had to, of course, use dial up. So this would cost so much uh, per minute. Else it would get too expensive. That was, internet was great. Like suddenly, this uh, I had grown up in a little fillet, like 100, 200 people. So you know everybody, everybody, everybody knows you. <laughs> um, that's basically your entire world. And suddenly, like, you've got the internet. And I kind of got stuck on the. Um, it's basically also in the time that I was learning English, because I was. I was raised in the Netherlands, so you start learning English pretty soon because you have to to survive. And the internet back then was basically everything was English. So that's how you get started. Um, basically, great. Just okay, downloading Super Nintendo ROMs and emulators and everything, everything illegal because hey, it's possible and cheap, but also forums, talking with people, uh, learning to use IRC, Instant Relay Chat, um, suddenly talking with people around the world. I remember the first time talking to someone from the US in English. That was so exciting because that person understood me. I could talk with a person the other side of the world live. Eh, yeah, that was pretty amazing back then. So. But yeah, goodbye innocence. 2005, after my parents had a force, moved around uh, the Netherlands a bit, I began to realize that something was not quite right. Just more of a feeling like, um, I was. Uh, this do-it-yourself store, just walking around there with my uh, mother, just, uh, just getting some stuff there, and I suddenly noticed that I was trying to walk in a feminine manner. It was weird, because I was supposed to be a guy. I mean, I was supposed to be uh, born as a boy, uh, had all the re requisite parts for it, and but somehow I wanted to be seen as a woman. This is weird. That night, I started to think about it more, like, doesn't really make sense. Why would I want that people look at me as if I am a woman, but I am a guy, so doesn't make sense. That's For about one week I thought I must be transsexual because that's the only thing I know that's not strictly binary. So, okay, then I must be, um, must be transsexual. Okay. But thanks to the internet, I started doing a bit more research and I stumbled over an, artic uh, an article about intersex. And that's really changed my life because I had not known that something like intersex existed. So because of the internet, I suddenly had a clue about what I actually was. I could um, examine, investigate more, do more research, look at my body. Because that's really the thing. Like I have stared so long, so many times at 
mirrors. Just look at myself, look at my own, on my own image, because I have been told for years, you're a, you're a boy, you're a guy, that's where you are, that's what you look like. But then looking back, puberty, but on puberty, almost nothing happened in terms of secondary changes. Okay, um, I had a bit of um, breasts growing, that was weird, so okay, I'll ignore that. Uh, didn't beard grow or something like that, not really. Anything else, masculine, not really. Uh, my clothing fits a bit weird, so I had to go for the really tiny male sizes, weird. But you're still a guy, so, or not. Look, uh, doing more investigations on Wikipedia and around the internet and stumbling over this. Um, so many, there are so many forms of intersex, not just like uh, your intersex, period, done. No, you've got hundreds of different, different types, more common ones, more rare ones, and in a sense, it's kind of fun to play your own doctor, doing your own physical examinations and doing the uh, differential diagnostics and everything, but it's also kind of annoying. <laughs> but in the end, it came all down to intersex. That's the logo I created uh, a few years ago, and I think it symbolizes pretty much uh, the whole thing. Got extremes, and basically, you're a song there in between there, but n not really a specific point. So, what do you do with that? There's also support, just the internet, IRC, chat, just MSN. It still exists back then. Uh, just talking with people, video chats, uh, regularly just um, communicating with people. And of course, I, I wasn't going to tell people about how I was different because, uh, well, I'd never been really clear about my about my gender identity or anything like that. I was just a person on the internet. <coughs> and then. Um, it was basically in, when I found out it's in 2007, that I first got a concrete evidence that I was like, okay, I still kept keeping it a secret. Maybe I should start telling people. So um, I started over just, okay, I will just write it down in a um, text file and type it and send it to some people um, who I trust to be able to talk about it. That's how it started. So um, you've got like um, four, six people. You just, okay, I want to tell you something. And you email them the file, they read it. And then they're like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Or, hey, I'm, I'm still here for you. Or it doesn't change anything. And that's great. That's in having to keep it a secret or feeling that you have to keep it a secret, even on the internet. I mean, people are like, boy, on the internet you can be anyone, uh, anything, but you still have contacts with people. So, for example, you're in a uh, chat group on the ERSA, and you, you talk to the same people over and over, and of course you learn a bit about the other person, and you yeah, don't want to get too personal, because on the internet you're more interested in just staying on topic sometimes but then you have something really personal you really want to talk about and you're like okay well it shouldn't matter just like um i also know people uh who i've met usually uh of irc who are for example blind and they just communicate um just with a screen reader and everything you have no idea until they tell you does it matter doesn't really matter but I was still stuck in this mindset of, well, I, I cannot tell here in real life uh, about it, people around me in my environment. 
I cannot do that because this whole coming out thing, but then intersex style, I guess. Because you know, you don't want to change, you just want to. Um, currently, I am this person. Currently, I am this is where I am. Not that I want to change, or, but just everybody was wrong about who I am as a person and physically and everything. And it, it's, they basically took me until an American friend, with whom I did a lot of uh, video chatting back then, she told me in a chat, well, I was crying, just completely emotionally, just drained, broken, done. And she told me, you, can do this. you cannot do this alone. You cannot do this by yourself. We're now going to tell everybody. And she did it. And then I had no choice but to do it as well. And the response was basically just amazing. Because it was often said that, well, people you meet on the internet aren't real. That's not true. People on the internet with whom you've been talking for years, they're often more real than people you know in real life. You've often known them longer, you've talked more intensively about um, personal things and everything, and the support I got from that really helped me to just say, I'm going on, I can do this. Suddenly things are easier. That was the point when I became more open about it, just publicly, even uh, talking about on forums and everything. And that was the reason why I got the first medical help. It's the first point. Someone told me, hey, okay, in the Netherlands it's not allowed to just pay for an MRI scan. Because I want I had um this idea, well, I think okay, I'm intersex, I think I am a hermaphrodite. I have both male and female organs. Assumption. What do you need for that to check that? Well, MRI scan. So, but in the Netherlands it's not legal. You cannot just pay for an MRI scan. So someone told me, hey, you can go to Germany, mm -hmm, first in Germany, and you can just get an MRI scan there, just for whatever. Just as long as you can pay for it, it's fine. So I had an MRI scan made of my abdomen. I will never forget the look on the face of the radiologist when she told me <laughs> her first question to me was were you op operated on before? No. Well here is the vagina and there you see everything and congratulations <laughs> everything is there. That was the first confirmation that I am indeed a hermaphrodite. I have both male and female genitals. Thanks to the internet, because I would not, never figure it out on my own without having all those resources and contacts with people who would just tell me, hey, you can go there and there's that website of a service. We just offer uh, the say uh, that um, company which just organizes everything for that, for the, such an MRI scan. That is just amazing. So I did that. Great. Find a confirmation. Second point, you can just order anything, anything hormones, because I, I did uh, hormone therapy for a while until my body decided that it wasn't necessary anymore. Um, and I just ordered it online without prescription for uh, a couple of years because, well, I wasn't getting a doctor crazy enough to just prescribe me uh, those hormones or medicine, anything because they didn't believe that I was in just sex. I had the MRI scans there and could you please help me? No, you're just a normal boy or you're trans uh, transsexual and I become really intimate with the uh, transgender protocol with those years of talking and the real life tests and that was not fun. That was really not fun. But because of the internet, I found a way around it because of the people who helped me and I got hormones, I got started on that. I had to also figure out the right dose for those hormones because 
nobody wanted to help me, so I had to go uh, online to figure out, okay, uh, I need some, some um, in my blood, I need uh, those values, I calculate it, convert it from uh, milligrams, I think they often use to nanomol, and that was really fun, yay physics. Um, but that all worked. And so I finally got something going with hormone therapy, just done it all myself. And things just seem to get a little bit better. Then starting 2009, um, well, the media, they can really find you really well if you have an online presence, which I've noticed. So I would just um, I still get these people, con uh, journalists contact me, um, email, Facebook, everything. Like, hey, do you want to do an interview? So I've, since 2009, I've basically done the whole thing. Inc yeah, including talk shows and everything, radio, television shows, newspapers, magazines. It's, it's pretty crazy to think about. And of course, starting my own website, weblog. Weblog uh, is also great because people have told me, well, you can just write it down. If writing down helps you, you can just write it down in a dictionary. Uh, in <laughs> I've got a word. But you, you can just write it down on paper or type it somewhere and store it on the hard drive of your computer and leave it there. But does that help? Because what I've noticed is that when you are really open about it, when you're really open about, okay, this is who I am, this is what's happening to me, these are my plans for the future, this is what I want to accomplish, this is what stands in my way, and then you let people read that. And then you get contacted by people. I've met so many other intersex people because of my weblog, mostly. Because I write about it, and of course this gets indexed by Google, and someone searches, and they're like, hey, blog post about, oh, the symptoms, I know that, and that sounds familiar. And then they contact you, or they start following you on Twitter, and then they contact you later, and you're like, huh, I'm not alone. Because intersex isn't really rare, it's like 4% of the um, population with some type of intersex, just about just no real proper statistics because nobody wants to research it, but something like that. There are quite a few, but meeting them, just finding out because most intersex people are still like, uh, just like how I was years ago. Don't want to talk about it, don't want to be open about it, don't want to let people know. So what I have done is pretty useful. That's what I've noticed also with in the media, because there, like in the Netherlands, I was always the one intersex person in the whole entirety of the Netherlands who they could actually find and was willing to appear publicly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, maybe I'm just weird like that, but I think being open about it is the better way to go about it. So, yeah, also that's um, interesting enough. When I did a, did a talk show, a less talk show in the Netherlands, then uh, next day, actually publisher contact me, hey, I would like to publish your autobiography. Okay, that's big. I'm still, I'm still working on that one. <laughs> Takes a while. Lots, lots of things have happened since then, so it's becoming better and better. But yes, um, 13 plus years, meanwhile, it's been pretty crazy. Just contacting um, doctors everywhere and just trying to get something going, trying to get some answers, and I have received some answers, but biggest answers I've got really, um, well, the second point, because in 2015, I suddenly began to notice, hey, I've got a really funny little brown line there, Linea nigra. That's something you're supposed to only get when you're pregnant. Okay. Or 
as someone told me off the internet, as a nurse in the uh, United States, it can also happen if you have too much um, female hormones in your system. That's how I found out that I didn't need a hormone therapy anymore because I had a complete overdose and I was getting uh, not just a bit PMS, but like extreme PMS. I have a normal cycle, as I've learned. And basically my body decided, hey, let's try this female thing and properly this time. So, yay. <laughs> this also resulted in not so pleasant symptoms uh, every month because, well, no doctor has deemed it necessary yet to really look at this closed off vagina and I have a uh, monthly uh, cycle, so that's not a good idea. So I'm still looking for medical help there. <laughs> and I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, that's going to be really exciting the coming time, but we'll always have the internet. So there is still hope. If you compare that to, well, the world without the internet. That's, that's you just walking there with a condition which nobody else had and you have no clue about what's, what's going on there and you just feel different and you feel alone and there's nobody you can talk to and nobody understands you and there is no help. You can go to a local doctor but they tell you, well, you're just crazy. I've had lots of doctors tell me that I'm crazy before I got medical evidence that I was not crazy, but yes. That's the kind of world which you really, really, really don't want to have. And that's basically the point of this entire uh, talk, I guess. Like imagining what my life would have been like right now if I did not have access to the internet. If I had not met all those people who have helped me, who have given me advice, who have been there, who have told me on many occasions, hey, I'm here for you, we can, we can just talk about it, or I found something here, and or wait, I will contact this person for you. And suddenly, like, uh, I've actually uh, had one real surgery so far, that is to, because um, I needed to have my um, my official gender identity changed because, well, I looked like this and I still had a male official identity. That's really confusing because you're sitting there in a waiting room and they're asking for a sir pause. You get up, people get really confused and you have to explain, okay, yes, it's I'm intersex and it's like that and so, and then they're like, oh, okay, okay, and then next time you're somewhere else in the waiting room, you can do it all over again. And that for years and years. And I was really not happy with that. So I actually was able to research how you get that changed. I found a lawyer in uh, Netherlands to actually uh, who could help me with that. I needed to uh, prove that I was no longer fertile as, uh, as a male because this how it used to work in Netherlands not anymore, I don't think. So um, then the conundrum from, okay, I need to, uh, easiest way is to just have those testicles removed, but that's not allowed in the Netherlands because you can only get, uh, voluntarily get your testicles removed in the Netherlands if you, uh, well, A, you have cancer, or B, you're uh, undergoing uh, the uh, gender reconstructive surgery. So as a transgender person, and you've gone through those 15, 20 years of uh, everything. So, but I found help in the uh, in Germany, again. Just talked with, uh, with a transgender friend in Germany. was like, hey, well, you need to have your testicles removed, or my surgeon here in Hamburg can probably help me. I can help you. And he could, and he did more, did also exploratory surgery and everything. And like for two weeks, I had um, our testicles were not fully developed, so I was never fertile as a male. Also, come, that explained why I had almost no testosterone. Yay. Again, that is the, uh, the reality we live in with the internet. That you're able to contact people, that you 
talk with people. They can give you uh, advice, help, links, references, everything. Or you could be stuck in a reality like that, where you're like, okay, well, everything is weird. I don't understand anything. Where do I go from here? And if I'm, that's, I don't really want to think about that, to be honest. Because if you start thinking about that, that reality, then it's also easy to just realize that, well, likely I wouldn't be here on this planet anymore. So, no, I don't like this reality. I really don't like it. So, yeah, uh, there's still a future ahead of me, fortunately. First point is really important because, well, I'm quite visible on the on the internet, but being intersex is something like, for example, um, you want to get anything done pertaining medically to your uh, intersex condition. For the insurance, it's always marked as a transgender thing, always, because the insurance here in Germany or in Netherlands, they don't know this intersex thing. So any procedure, any surgery that gets performed, even if I had to uh, undergo the, the reconstructive surgery from my female side to reconstruct that, to open it, that would be marked and covered by insurance as a transgender surgery. So that doesn't help politics. But this intersex thing, I've done a bit of lobbying in the Netherlands. That was fun. Doesn't help. They don't care. I've talked with one politician after emailing so many, one was like, oh, we can talk about it, just just throw by it some time. We talked about it, and yeah, that was it, basically. Others were like, well, yeah, we're already doing something with that. Something. <sighs> the medical help, yes, because I've got, um, because of the uh, physical changes to my body, I've kind of got chronic pains, that's kind of annoying, so also at some point, third point, well, the autobiography, I started writing on it in, well, late 2013, but then lots of stuff happened, I mean, writing about the second, um, yeah, so many things I could I could add to it. So actually, that I didn't get it written in 2014 was a good thing because now I can write about lots more things. Or I could have written a second autobiography, of course, hey, more money. Um, but this works too. So that's something I still have to finish. And well, I also have to work. I have to make money. I have to eat. I have to live somewhere. So that's also important. But other than that, I think I've got everything covered there. So. How do I do that? That's the question. Well, the internet is again the answer. Because uh, actually, I, I recently lost my, uh, my last job, but I got completely overwhelmed with, uh, with messages from recruiters who were like, hey, we want you. So thanks to the internet, that's really not a problem. If, okay, and I will probably be moving to um, the UK because that's where they want me when that works. So, and then I have to look there for more medical help and make more contacts and just use the internet to my advantage. So um, that's quite a bit of uncertainty you've got there, but uh, compared to just, just being there without any easy contacts, without people around you, whom you can talk to, where you can ask for help, um, there is nothing better than having the internet that you can just, uh, even on, on Twitter, just cry for help. Just like, hey, I feel terrible, that's a problem, can someone help me? And some of the response is like, I can help you. Just that contact is so easy. And 
I think that's, that's, that's what gives a lot of hope for the future as well, because you know that, okay, even if things aren't great right now, because there's the internet, because you've got those millions of people out there, someone of those millions of people, they may have the solution, they may have the, the, that life that's better, and that's, they may have the answer, sometimes an easy answer, some, sometimes part of the answer, like the people I've met uh, over the past, well, there's one person who can tell me, oh, you have to go there, then you can have an MRI scan made, and that person like, well, I've got here, surgeon, those are the big pizzas. And sometimes just someone would just say something, and you're like, you're right. Small things. And that really, really, really helps. Um, yeah, my autobiography. Um, what do I expect from an writing my autobiography? Because I've got my weblog. That's of course interesting, but <laughs> the problem with my weblog is I've been writing on it since 2007. I've written more than a thousand posts. Nobody in his right mind is going to read through all of them. I mean, you would be mad. I mean, I wouldn't do it. Just thousands, twelve hundred posts. I don't. I've lost count years ago. I just write, publish on there, and I can forget it. Autobiography is more that I can cover the entirety of my story, also the early period and everything, in a more, it's still autobiographic, of course, naturally, but more concise and easy to read and just pull it all together in one work, that someone can just start it, start reading, finish it with, well, depends on how fast you read, I guess. To make it a real um, coherent experience and fun. And for myself, it's helpful as well because to, um, there's a difference still between writing a weblog. Weblog is just it's a diary. So you just write on it uh, every day or once a week or once a month, once a year, uh, because you have something that you need to get off your chest. You have to write about it right now. So when I, um, when I just look back on what I write about, like most of the time when you're writing a blog post, it's because you have something that you really urgently need, need to say, or you're just upset, you just need just upset, uh, something terrible happened, but to write about the whole picture. And that's something which I don't think I really covered in my, uh, my blog, exactly. So, <laughs> and of course, my career is also an interesting point, because as you could see at the beginning of my uh, presentation, um, I was kind of raised by computers. That also means that uh, I learned to program like when I was seven or such, um, because well, that's how you talk with computers. So yeah, I, I've always done that in um, school, never really done that, it's boring. But um, I'm currently, in my career, I'm a senior C++ developer. And I've never really done any kind of education thing there. I've used the internet to learn. And that's another area where if I did not have that, if I had to rely uh, purely on the school system, <laughs> no way. So, Everything taken together, I guess that despite um, how things are not made easier for me, it's still because of the internet, I was able to find ways to get around obstacles, to create and hold on to a future for myself. And hopefully with my autobiography and with my weblog and everything to also change the lives of so many other people because it's not just about me. It's also something which you really learn when you're on the internet, yeah, for most people. There are so many people out there, so many people like yourself, so many people who need the same help as you, so many people you can help just by, by writing something, like the impact of a blog article. Sometimes you're like, okay, well, nobody reads that. You look in the statistics, uh, 500 people have read that, 1,000 people have read that. 
Oh, somewhere in Italy an article has been published about it. Uh huh. Has impact. Everything you do, especially uh, when you're writing about topics like this, you have impact on the lives of so many other people. I've influenced directly the lives of people, um, other intersex people, by just uh, talking with them and allowing to, or sharing my experience with them, and they could make a decision about their own life, which made them happy, happier in the end. So that's a pretty big deal. And that's also, yeah, I want to do more of that in the future, because it's kind of fun to make people happy. I guess we've reached that point. Does anyone have any questions? Maya, thank you so much. You do a great job for everyone else. So, are there any questions? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> there are no dumb questions. I promise you, there are no dumb questions. There are just stupid answers. Oh, but she's clever enough to give a good answer. So, just ask right away. She she is so open and she she knows so much. So. <laughs> Wow, well, it seems yeah. you have an early off. <laughs> Freedom. Okay, uh, yes, great. <laughs> Hello. Um, oh, Misha. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was a really great insight. Uh, what is the current legal situation in your country since, since you weren't allowed to do this legally a few years ago? Has it changed in the Netherlands? The uh, gender change, you mean? Yes. I think they, uh, I've heard that they've actually made it uh, so that you don't need to prove that you're not fertile anymore as the, uh, the old gender. So it's become a bit easier there. I mean, I would still have um, opted to just remove those uses testicles because, well, they weren't functioning and they didn't need them. So they're just annoying. So um, for me, it wouldn't make a difference, but I think that for a lot of uh, non-binary people who are like, oh, I just want to change it, they've got more options and that's always a good thing. So um, recently there were changes to the German laws regarding the third gender. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about it? Would like you would probably apply for those, or you? I don't know how to put this. Like you are not a German uh, citizen, right? You are from mm -hmm. the Netherlands. But yeah. if you were, would the would those apply to you? That's uh, actually one of those really big questions, like, um, because I've of course changed my official gender from male to female, simply to fit my appearance and just, well, I feel more like a woman. Yay. I need, not that song, not that song again. Um, that's a third gender. It's like, what I really want is to just stop talking about gender because it's not that important. It's like everything is gender, 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 even when you don't need it. Like, why do we need to have gender in, in a, a passport? Why does it matter? Why is it being registered? Why is it not something which is just uh, when you're born, they made a, make a note there, like 100% uh, male or 90% male, or <laughs> say IES or uh, hermaphrodite or something else, and just leave it at that. Just register it, that's uh, interesting statistics. Uh, interesting also for your uh, personal doctor, but the government shouldn't care about that, and other people shouldn't care about that. It should just be. So I'm, I'm still registered as uh, as female. Would I want to be registered as uh, an ex? No. 
that's just missing the point. This is uh, segregation. I, I don't want to be an ex. I don't want to be male. I'm for now. I'm perfectly fine just being called female and uh, ma'am. Much better as sir. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, you said that you um, would like to be more female. Uh, are you also a bit sad to leave the male gender behind? Well, in the first place, I'm human. Second place, I'm a hermaphrodite. And I want to keep it that way. So uh, even if I do find a surgeon who wants the uh, reconstructive surgery with opening of the vagina, creating the labia and everything, the penis would stay there because it's just it's mine. I'm keeping it because it's useful. It's just practical. Come on, who would not want that? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thanks again for your talk. Um, what would you wish for in sex education? And also, uh, at which age do you think we should educate people about this? Because as um, seen in your talk, this has been something that has um, been with you for a very long time. That's also a very good question. <laughs> the, the thing is that uh, the whole problem with intersex and sex education starts before, long before the child has even been born. Because everything is about this, uh, this binary spectrum, or binary system, I should say. Definitely system. Because even before a child is born, it's like, well, is it a boy, is it a girl? It starts with that. Which color do we pick for the, for the room? Which clothes do we buy for the baby? Which name do we pick? Everything is gender, 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 gendered. And then a child is born and they do not conform to uh, with their genitals to either males or females. And you're like, okay, it was confusing. We don't want to be confused. We as parents or we as doctors, we don't like being confused. We don't want to think. We just want to fix it. And those normalization surgeries, as they're called, they're a big problem. There's also a problem with the, uh, the parents, because they don't know that intersex exists. They get a child with funny looking genitals, so is, is that a vagina, is that a penis, I'm not sure. Is it both, like you see a penis and then a hole below there, that's often with hermaphrodites. I was lucky that it was not visible in my case, or I would have a scar there and something would have been removed already. That's something which, um, when, when a woman becomes pregnant, they should already know about intersex. They should be educated about it. They should know that it's nothing bad, nothing serious. Um, when ch children grow up, they should not be forced into a gender realm. That's something that we, as, as adults, as parents, as educators, something we can already do. That's something which we have to do. It's not just, oh, we just leave it to biology uh, classes, like then they will learn about intersex and everything will be right. That's not how it works. It has to be an integral part of society that people know, oh, well, okay, you've got men, you've got women, and you've got everything else, and that's a really big spectrum with lots of different uh, bodies, and people would not fit into those two extremes. And where do you start with that? Well, everywhere. Parents, teachers, general public, uh, what I'm trying to do currently. And of course, um, well, the, the law that is actually, uh, there's also another law in Germany about uh, related to third gender, namely that uh, a baby can be born in Germany and does not immediately have to be assigned a gender. That's, that's a positive first step, because then you take away the pressure of choosing. And why would you have to choose, okay, your baby gets born, why would you have to choose whether it must be male or female? How could you? I mean, we have transgender people, their chromosomes do not match up with, uh, with their assigned designated gender. How could you figure out for an intersex child 
what gender they would prefer. Why would you make them male or female? Why would you take away those organs and leave the other? So that's a really big issue, what we've got there, and it's something that has to be... <laughs> something that really has to be tackled at uh, so many levels then. Then maybe one follow-up question. Um, are you annoyed that the intersex issue is, or it, it seems that uh, what is talked about as first is genitals, or do you think we should talk about genitals much more in general? Uh, I really don't think that genitals are that important. I mean, sure, if you've got a partner, then it's nice if you like, hey, you've got cool genitals, I like those. But beyond that, I don't think, like, uh, why would your boss care about your genitals? Why would uh, would some politician care about your genitals? Why would uh, the guy sitting next to in your church care about your genitals? What's the relevance of that? And there's some there's a point where I say that let just let people just be people. So everything else is just all complicating things, and things must stay simple. That's much more fun. Thank you, Maya.